Welcome to the plenary session on corporations and American life. I'm Naomi Lamoureux from Yale University, and what I'm going to do first of all is introduce all of our panelists, and uh, then we'll begin. The idea is that we'll each speak for uh, at most 15 minutes, and uh, then we'll open it up to uh, a more informal Q&A from the audience and also uh, maybe some argument among ourselves. So let me introduce uh, our panelists. We're, we'll speak in the order of the program, so I'll introduce them in the order of the program. Um, I will speak first, and then after uh, that, Richard White will speak. Richard White is Margaret Byrne Professor of American History at Stanford. He is the author of a number of important prize-winning books, including It's Your Misfortune and None of My Own, A New History of the American West. Uh, the Middle Ground, Indians, Empires, and Republics in the Great Lakes Region, 1615 to 1815. And uh, his most recent book, Railroaded, The Transcontinentals and the Making of Modern America, which is what got him interested in the subject of corporations. Our second speaker will be Bethany Morton, who is Associate Professor of History and Women's Studies at the University of Georgia. She is the author of the prize-winning book, To Serve God and Walmart, The Making of Christian Free Enterprise, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2009. She has uh, two book projects in the works about Christianity and modern capitalism, and is the editor of a new series, Studies in the History of U.S. Capitalism, which is uh, going to be published by uh, Columbia University Press, and you might have seen the nice write-up about it in uh, the New York Times this, this past weekend. Uh, our next speaker will be Karen Ho, who is in the Anthropology Department at the University of Minnesota. She studies finance capitalism, and her book, Liquidated, An Ethnography of Wall Street, was published by Duke University Press in 2009. She is currently working on an alternative cultural history slash genealogy of financial risk. And then our final speaker today uh, will be uh, Peter James uh, Hudson, who is assistant professor in the Department of History at Vanderbilt University. He is currently completing a manuscript called Dark Finance, Wall Street and the West Indies, 1873 to 1933. And he has recently published essays on the history of the National City Bank of New York and Haiti, which was published in the Radical History Review, and on the Royal Bank of Canada in the Caribbean, which was published in Race and Class, a journal on racism, empire, and globalization. So in a few minutes, we'll start. We'll almost momentarily start. Let me just say that I'm going to start by talking at the high level on, on the Supreme Court, this panel was to some extent inspired by Citizens United decision. And as we work through the, through the speakers, we'll get closer, we'll go down and look at, at actual corporate practice. Okay. So my talk is uh, called Corporations and the 14th Amendment. And I'm drawing for this talk on a paper that Ruth Block and I are writing for a project which is sponsored by the Tobin Project. It's on corporations and American democracy. And this project, like our panel, was, was inspired by the 2010 Supreme Court case of Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. Now, this just to review this case, of course, overturned the part of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of, of 2010 two and determined that the, the government could not suppress uh, political speech on the basis of the speaker's identity as a corporation. Well, reading this case, the Tobin Project's leader, David Moss of the Harvard Business School, thought that the court's decision was based on, shall I say, a limited understanding of history. And he wondered if the judges had had better history to draw on or, or more extensive history to draw on, whether they would have come to a different conclusion. Well, that's hardly hard to believe in the case of some of them, right? But, but perhaps that swing 
that Swain Justice Anthony Kennedy might, might be swayed by historical scholarship. So certainly, there's a lot to be done in scholarship on the corporation. There's a lot of confusion in both pu public and scholarly discussions of the corporation. And these confusions bleed into the law. So I want to talk today about two confusions that I think have interacted with each other in a pernicious way, which is part of the story of how we got to Citizens United. So one confusion is the tendency to talk about the corporation and, and to equate it with big business. Um, of course, there are lots and lots and lots of small businesses that take the corporate form. But what's going to be more important for, for uh, I think, the confusion in the law, and for my purposes today, is that the corporate form is used for many types of organizations besides businesses. Um, most early corporations were what we would today call nonprofits. Business corporations actually came a bit later, or, or were in widespread use a bit later. And of course, many nonprofits today use the corporate form. This broad use of the corporate form is not only a source of confusion in our language and our public discourse, it also affects the law. Because decisions involving nonprofit corporations are often generalized to the, to the situation for business corporations and vice versa. And Citizens United is a perfect example of this, as I'll show you. So the second confusion is the idea that the Supreme Court is a historical confusion. It's the idea that the Supreme Court decided in 1886, in the famous case of Santa Clara versus Southern Pacific Railroad, that corporations were persons in the meaning of the 14th Amendment. And as I'm going to suggest to you, this is only a partial truth. We often see this as a blanket claim in the popular literature. We see it as a blanket claim in the scholarly literature. And we even see it in the law. For example, in 1978, in the case of First United Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, which is one of the key precedents for Citizens United, the, the justice who wrote the opinion, Lewis Powell Jr., has a footnote in his opinion for the majority that says, quote, it has been settled for almost a century that corporations are persons within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. And he cites Santa Clara and one other case from the period. He was chastised by just the Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist in his dissenting opinion for getting the law wrong. Um, but since then, it's Powell's footnote that gets, that gets cited and not Rehnquist's actually correct view of the history. So I want to start with this second confusion about Santa Clara. And if you call up the case on your computer and you don't investigate any further, you are likely to think that Powell was correct. And the reason is because the case begins with the report of a statement that the then Chief Justice Morrison Waite made at the start of oral arguments. It's not part of the decision. Okay, it's just a part, it's reported at the beginning. The decision was not made on constitutional grounds. And this is what he said. The court does not wish to hear argument on the question of whether the provision in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which forbids a state to deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws applies to these corporations. We are all of the opinion that it does. OK. The, even if you take this statement at face value as the opinion of the court, it refers just to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So if you look at the 14th Amendment, just the first section of the 14th Amendment, it's referring to that part that I've highlighted in red. Well, what about the rest of the amendment? Well, there were a number of other decisions in the late 19th and early 20th century that denied to corporations the protections highlighted in blue on the slide, so that the full parsing actually looks something like this, with the purple words kind of going both ways. Um, so what I want to do is to take this parsing and look at the, look as quickly as I can at the cases that were behind it, and, and, then, and then and try to give you a sense of how important all of these different cases are to the way um, the law worked in the late 19th and the early 20th century. But the first thing I want to say, that there's one Supreme Court justice 
more than any other who's behind all of, all of those decisions that lead to that parsing. And that's Stephen J. Field. And he was, to say the least, a colorful character. He was a man on the make. He was accused of being a tool of the roads. He probably was. Um, Field was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1863 by Lincoln. Lincoln needed a Westerner because Supreme Court justices ride in circuit, road circuit in that period. And he needed someone from the West. And so it was when he was riding circuit in California that Field heard cases that led to Santa Clara. And they're, well, they're known collectively as the railroad tax cases. So they're triggered by a provision. They're really a lot of anti-railroad feeling in California. And when, when California comes to rewrite its constitution in 1879, it imposes higher taxes on railroads um, than everyone else. And so the railroads challenge this, uh, encouraged by um, Field probably, uh, as a, as a violation of the rights under the 14th uh, Amendment. And the cases were heard at the local uh, level first, local federal circuit court level here by a local California judge and by Field. Field wrote the opinions, There's, there are two of these opinions, and he found in favor of the railroads. So let's look at what he said in Santa Clara. He said, well, first of all, that corporations um, are creatures of the state that they don't exist independently of the law. That was sort of standard view of corporations. But then he went on to say, well, the proper the, the people who are affected by the, those unequal taxes are the are the people who make up this association. And the members don't lose their rights, their constitutional rights, just because they join in a in a corporation. Um, and so he said, well, if to protect the members of the corporation, we have to find that. That the, that the corporation has 14th Amendment rights, but he's writing about the people who made up the uh, corporation. Now the case is appealed to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court, as I mentioned, actually ducked the constitutional issue in Santa Clara um, and made its decision on the basis of California law. So it's kind of odd that the case gets cited, Waite's statement gets cited as precedent for the idea that corporations have rights under the 14th Amendment. Interestingly, this is largely Fields do doing. He's the one who cited uh, a weight statement or that at Santa Clara's precedent in many of his opinions. But it's important to, to uh, it's important to think about how or to understand how he used the precedent. And here, this first part of the quote is important because he is starting from the idea that corporations are creatures of the state, that they could not exist independently of the law, and that the law can prescribe conditions under which they can be formed and continued. He's saying that states have regulatory authority over corporations. And if you actually look at all the cases that cited that Field wrote citing Santa Clara, what he's doing is he's actually upholding that regulatory authority. So these are the main uh, cases that get uh, cited as establishing this, this precedent. And you can see that they're all, five? Whoa, okay. You can see that they're all, uh, they're all upholding various kinds of regulation. Okay. So I'm going to quickly go over his other decisions. All right, so another case that's really important, Paul v. Virginia. This is being decided right as the, as, the, uh, as, the, as the 14th Amendment is being ratified. Field says corporations um, don't have privileges and immunities of citizens. And so states can exclude foreign corporations entirely um, they may restrict its business, they can, they can regulate them, they can discriminate against them. Okay, um, now this, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip over some of these slides because I, these are just cases I was gonna present to show that this is really important in the law, that this, these precedents are used in upholding state antitrust laws and so on. I wanna go on to uh, a last part of, of, uh, of uh, Fields parsing of the 14th Amendment. So he's talking about the people who make up corporations. He says, you know, they have property and it's their property that's at stake in corporations. 
Um, but their liberty is not at stake. Their lives aren't at stake. And so corporations don't get protections for life or liberty. Okay? They get protections for property, but not life or liberty. Okay, and in fact, this is really an important precedent. This, this, the, and there's a famous case, Northwestern Life Insurance versus Riggs, 1906, written by John Marshall Harlan, Harlan the first. Uh, the liberty referred to in the 14th Amendment is the liberty of natural, not artificial persons. This was repeated the next year in another case. This case gets cited as often as Santa Clara in the next two, three, four decades. Okay. But then it gets erased. Okay. Um, and the question is, well, how does this all get erased from our memory? But before I say that, I just want to say that this whole constellation of cases actually supports the first campaign finance laws in the Tillman Act in 1907. There is nothing inconsistent with this reading of the 14th Amendment and campaign finance law. And, and in, in fact, there's only one challenge to this law, which is this one in 1916. It's not even appealed to the Supreme Court. It's, it remains, this remains law in expanded form. Congress keeps amend, amending it over time. Okay. So things change. Well, lots of things change to erase the memory of this whole parsing of the, uh, of the 14th Amendment. And there's way too much that changes for me to talk about. So I want to focus in the last minute or so, the, the couple minutes I have left, on uh, one change. And this is that the, uh, the court is increasing, and this is where the second confusion comes in, because the court is increasingly forced to confront corporations that are being repressed by the state with their membership cor corporations, the corporations formed to push for liberty. And so I'm just going to go over this really quite quickly. Um, but Jane Daly was mentioning these cases in just a, a, a few minutes ago in the legal history section. It's cases that link the civil rights movement to broader constitutional movements. But the NACP was a corporation. CORE was a corporation. They're both chartered by the state of New York. And what the, what the state of Alabama, the state of Mississippi, the state of Virginia start to do is to use um, the state powers over corporations to repress the NAACP, to repress CORE. And one minute, okay. And so here, uh, I'll just flip through these cases. Ruth and I, I can send you Ruth and my paper if you're interested. But what you're going to see here, what you're going to see here, is it's in these cases that a First Amendment right for, for corporations is articulated. Okay. So here you see it in core, be Douglas. <clears throat> All right, so let me, this gets us back to Field again, right? Field says, well, the lives and liberties of incorporators aren't in a, in, in a, at stake, but he was talking about for-profit companies. These are membership co companies, and the lives and liberties of the members are at stake, and the court had to treat them differently. Um, but this confused everything, right? Because these precedents then start being applied to for-profit corporations as well. And things are really confused, and I'm just going to conclude now when we get to Citizens <coughs> United, okay? Because Citizens United is a nonprofit voluntary association. And the court had been carving out gradually some exemptions for nonprofit voluntary associations um, with regard to the campaign finance laws over the previous couple decades. That the first example is the PACs, right? And we can talk about that in the QA if you're interested in it. But in Citizens United, the the court make the court squelches, the majority squelches that incipient effort to not be confused about corporations, to not treat for-profit corporations the same as voluntary associations. And so the Citizens United decision then expands um, and, and uh, removes the campaign finance limitations on for-profits as well. It may be too much to hope that a clear sense of the history and, 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 how, and, those, and the decisions that originally cited 
uh, the originally supported campaign finance legislation might might have, might matter to the court today. But at least if history is going to matter, we should we should make sure they get it right. Okay, thank you. seats up here if you want to come up. Um, and I'm also going to shut this. And I'm going to um, start a timer to time myself to 15 minutes. So if you hear cheesy marimba music, it means I'm done. <laughs> I am going to talk about um, large business corporations, a quite specific kind, as Naomi says. But one of my basic points is the same as Naomi's. Corporations are protean. Most of the 19th century corporations that I studied did not have the defining marks of modern corporations. California, where we're sitting, for example, um, Chartism Corporation did not limit investors' liability to the money that they had invested. Those people who the corporations own money could come after the stockholders. Nor were corporations persons under the laws. Naomi says that's something that evolves over time. Nor did they have a managerial class clearly distinct from ownership. Corporations were riddled with nepotism, the exchange of gifts and favors for jobs, and competing cliques loyal to different officers and directors. But corporations do change. They adopt to and also shape new political, social, and economic contexts. And they also take on new shapes in response to quite contingent political crises. Corporations change, but the objections to them in American history have been very long standing. And in many ways, I'd say that the echoes, that the objections we hear today, are echoes of a much fuller and more robust critique in the 19th century. The core objection to corporations in the 19th century is that corporations are antithetical to democratic governance and that they are um, in opposition to key American values. And I think that still has a kind of resonance, much muted and much changed, but still present today. Now what I'm going to do, because this is a panel, is going to make some very broad and particularly unnuanced generalizations about the emergence of large hierarchical corporations and the opposition to them in the 19th century. And some of these are summaries of my own work and railroaded, but most are based on a superb business history literature that has too often gone underappreciated and, under, and unread by most historians. I think from the kinds of sessions being offered now, this is changing, but business history has been exploring this stuff for quite some time. Americans in the late 19th century identified large corporations with monopoly, but what they meant by monopoly is not what we mean by monopoly. They meant by monopoly any business that Americans could not avoid using in their daily life. And more than that, they meant businesses that, um, could, outcome, that could influence the outcome about, of competition between other Americans. Most of the opposition to corporations in the 19th century arises among business, though there are plenty of other people who object to them also. These corporations that I'm talking about were virtually synonymous with railroads in the late 19th century. But today, you could say under the kinds of definitions they used, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, the airlines, Amazon, all of them might, in one way or another, meet this kind of definition. And the argument they made is that these corporations were different. They took their power from their relationship to the state. Because railroad corporations were chartered by the state, because the government used its powers of eminent domain to aid them, because governments granted land to railroads and extended some railroads credit, and because the railroads were public highways under common laws, they had an obligation to the public much greater than those of normal businesses. When the Supreme Court upheld state regulation, the so-called Granger cases of 1877, it marked the corporations and railroad corporations as a special class of property, holding, quote, monopoly power in the sense that the public had no choice but to make use of their services. 
These monopolies could influence the outcome of competitions between customers, and this was at the center of the anti-monopolist critique. Much of it reflects back on an earlier Jeffersonianism and Jacksonianism that identified competition with freedom, and whose goal was the general equality of white men, and I'll emphasize white men, um, in American society. Over time, anti-monopolists would divide, abandon the ideal of equal competition, and small producers would move towards much more intrusive regulation and nationalization. But the original objection goes around competition. And this critique of corporations was as much or even more political than economic. When the Senate Select Committee on Interstate Commerce investigations in 1866, it concluded by saying, the essence of the complaints against the railroads, quote, was the practice of discrimination in one form or another, and that the great des desideratum is to secure equality. The equality was the equal status of all Republican citizens that all white men were supposed to enjoy. It was unjust for railroad corporations to set rates that discriminated against, discriminated against the citizens of the republic that gave it life. Now, when corporate monopolies outlined the consequences of corporate power, what they did is they feared for the republic. As one critique went, wealth was, quote, not distributed among all classes according to their industry of prudence, but is concentrated among those who enjoy the favor of the railway power. And the general independence and self-respect are made impossible. When such influences, quote, undercut the establishment of a nation of intelligent, self-respecting, and self-governing freemen, the result was little better than national suicide. This objection to corporations was going to be, oh, there goes my timing, um, going to be enhanced by the court decisions that Naomi mentioned. And I'm not going to go through those she has, but I will give the reaction of Governor George Stoneman when Field issued his San Mateo and Santa Clara decisions. When Stoneman, who's outraged by this, says the court was conflating corporate persons with actual living and breathing citizens, arguing the state itself, Stoneman argues, the state has a right to distinguish between, quote, the natural person, who is part of the government, and the artificial person, who is but a creature of the government. He said that Field's decision trampled logic and core Republican practice that stretched back to the founding of the Republic. Quote, lodging in the legislature and the legislature alone the right to determine taxes. This kind of anti-corporate sentiment was mainstream and was reflected in both political parties. And the anti monopolist critique goes to my second broad point. The government and most critics of the courts have made corporations what they are. And what this, this might sound like a pretty anodyne statement, one of the things that's amazed me is that among most historians, our understanding of corporations, and I'm not saying business historians here, still goes back to two books that I read when I was in graduate school. Alfred Chandler's The Visible Hand and Robert Weeby's The Search for Order. Both of these books are deeply functionalist in that they argue corporations succeeded because of their economies of scale, their efficiency, and their managerial competence. A whole array of business literature over the last 20 years has shown that this is simply not true. In most of the economy, corporations did not penetrate or remained a world of proprietary capitalism until, as Naomi has said in one of her books, the great merger movement comes about in the 1890s. And I would go further. One of the major themes of railroading is that corporations were not even particularly good at running businesses in where the sectors they did not. That the railroads sometimes seem a common train of ineptitude and inefficiency. They sank into receivership, constantly sought public aid and protection, and were saved from dismemberment only because the courts acknowledged their original legal roots as private entities providing public functions. They were common carriers whom the public depended upon and could not be dismembered to satisfy the claim of creditors. My final point is the triumph of corporations is linked very much to financial markets. And here I am in the comfortable position of having to insult my audience. Um, most academics, despite having lived their entire lives in a capitalist economy, are financially illiterate. I routinely hear when I write about finance that it's too hard. I've never had a, an academic tell me race is too hard or culture is too hard, but apparently finance is too hard. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is reduce here 
finance to metaphor, to try to bet my final point. <laughs> In the long run, the success of corporations depended on their ability to take over material representations of value, the profits that they made from running a train, or in fact the assets they held, and turn them into representations of value. It also, doing this allowed people who own corporations to make vast amount of money from corporations that lost vast amounts of money, which to me is always the great mystery of 19th century corporate capitalism. The genius of the corporate form became the ability to turn assets into representations of assets, paper, and manipulate the value of that paper through the control of information. It was as if all the material assets of the form were poured into a gigantic grinder, and what came out at the other end was paper. Stock was paper that represented the ownership of some fragment of the firm, but the stockholder could not claim any particular piece of corporate property. You didn't get a certain number of rails or a locomotive, for example. They were getting a representation of a portion of the company's capital that could increase or decrease in value, be subdivided or consolidated, and be exchanged without any change in the actual firm itself. One of the beauties of corporate capitalism was the very same physical assets that were ground up and transformed into stock were simultaneously ground up and turned into a second kind of paper, bonds. The bonds represented not a share of the company, but a loan of money to the corporation, backed by assets which were specified. Sometimes land, sometimes sections of track, sometimes equipment, sometimes a share of profits. In theory, if the corporation did not pay the interest due on the loan, the bondholders could collectively, if not individually, seize the physical elements of the railroads. In practice, the courts almost immediately forbade this, on the grounds that the railroads were chartered to provide transportation to the public, and nothing could be done, such as selling off a locomotive or track, that would prevent them from fulfilling this public function. Instead, the companies went into receivership. Courts appointed receivers to manage them and implement their refinancing to reduce their debts and interest charges. The bondholders were covered only what the receiver allowed. Corporations had become very early, not because of their efficiency, but because of their inefficiency. Not because of their success, but because of their failures. Corporations had become, by the 1880s, too big and too important to fail. Thank you. subject to the power of a vast monopoly. My computer's going to have to wake up. Um, I'll take the time while it's doing that uh, just to reiterate what Professor White just said about our sort of collective fear and loathing of finance and of numbers. Fortunately, on this panel, we have people represented who do not suffer from that. Uh, but if, like me, you do, we want to offer uh, right now a, a website is open for registration for a summer camp at Cornell uh, University up in Ithaca uh, for historians to come and have our uh, collective um, barriers to using numbers, uh, using quantitative research and financial instruments um, historically have those barriers lowered by a sort of boot camp in um, financial methods, quantitative methods in historical research. This is open to uh, graduate students and to faculty. Uh, the graduate students will participate in a very subsidized fashion um, through the, the glory of uh, collective ownership the uh, faculty can help subsidize that. Thank you. So if you're interested in taking up this challenge of um, bringing more quantitative research to your analysis of some of what I might be uh, addressing here, 
in terms of more familiar cultural and social topics, then please join us up in Ithaca this summer in July um, for that undertaking. Sorry, y'all, we really did have this set up, sorry. Are you seeing something? Um, evangelizing for the History of Capitalism series at the Columbia University Press. So since this is taking its sweet time, allow me to um, frame this as an invitation and uh, an altar call for people who might be considering uh, doing studies of corporations um, that you would be interested in seeing in this large conversation that multiple people, again, on this panel are referring to that goes on for generations of historians and of analysts speaking to us from other subfields um, about the history of capitalism, about how um, business history speaks to cultural history, to social history, to political history. If you are interested in taking up a corporation or other topic that you feel falls under history of capitalism, we're really interested in hearing from you at Columbia University Press. So this is, uh, in a sense, a brief on the topic um, of the corporation as a useful category of historical analysis, um, a plug, as it were, for uh, continued study, as we've heard for generations now, of historians taking up the corporation as a form, as an actor, and bringing creative analysis to it. Um, I'll start with a, the very visceral angle at which this subject grabbed me initially uh, in the hopes, again, of lowering resistance if the idea of studying a corporation is not just intrinsically attractive to you. And then I'll offer a few scholars' considerations of why corporations have merited so much attention in the specific context of the century's shifting topography of power. What are some of these large horizon questions that we can get to through the specific uh, trajectory of the corporation in the 20th century, which is um, what I was asked to address here. And finally, in keeping with the theme that Naomi introduced about the legal traditions uh, structuring Americans' experiences of corporate actors and the observations uh, from Professor White about how those forms have changed and uh, in response to what pressures, I'm gonna raise a pair of recent Supreme Court cases that continue that struggle over what corporate personhood means um, in interesting ways that again address scale and uh, power. So here's the image that made me want to write a book about a corporation. Uh, as probably most people know, uh, but certainly I did not when I started TAing in American Studies, this uh, image is Charles Sheeler's Chris Crossed Conveyors River Rouge Plant Ford Motor Company, which was produced in 1927 in that pure capitalist art form of the marketing campaign. So one of these great works of art that's now I think hanging in the um, Museum of Modern Art uh, is produced as part of advertising, of course, in this case for uh, Ford's Model A. And it was for me at least a revelation that one way to understand enormous tectonic shifts in American life was to concretize them in a single dominant industry or even a single corporation. The framework that understands the 20th century as in part the shift from Fordism to post-Fordism uh, gives us an additional layer of narrative complexity with different chronologies and geographies and cast of characters than some political narratives, right? This narrative structure can be very helpful for seeing the kinds of social arrangements and cultural practices that can slip through the net of more explicitly political historical narratives. So personally, I became interested in understanding the difference between a historical moment that can produce this high cultural artifact uh, and a moment like uh, our own recent past that can produce this one. This is Brendan O'Connell's How May I Help You, uh, which was part of his series built on uh, images that he took inside the aisles of Walmart stores and then turned into these Impressionist paintings, some of which have been bought by uh, the Walton family, which itself invests in art. Or um, this image, which may be familiar to many people, um, 
from Edward Bertinsky's Manufactured Landscapes. And so if you want to think of corporations in terms of supply chains, as many scholars have very fruitfully, uh, this would also be part of the story of this transition, right, from Fordism to then these instances of post-Fordism. So again, you don't have to accept this, uh, this narrative, but very quickly, this narrative would posit that the period of Fordism lasted from about 1914 to 1973, was characterized by mass production and mass consumption of consumer durables, by planned power sharing on the part of big business, big government and big labor, and social standardization through bureaucratic institutions, nuclear families, and a homogenizing nationalism. Strictly speaking, of course, Fordism refers to the mass production techniques, the management practices, and the wage scale pioneered by Henry Ford in the USA of the 20s and 30s, but can be used more broadly and has so fruitfully by many scholars to account for a host of attendant phenomena. By this reckoning, the assembly line at River Rouge, the generous wage, the stock ownership that capitalizes the plant, the racial screening and psychological tests administered to its potential employees, and the nuclear family that takes the Sunday drive are all articulations in a single process. It's also an international phenomenon, whether you're looking again at supply chains or at adaptations of the system from Soviet Fortifizatia to the Brazilian Fordlandia that Greg Brandon uh, wrote about recently. So you can step back from the corporation as a specific node and a concrete way to, uh, to capture these processes and then try to spread them over chronologies and geographies that perhaps aren't available uh, if you're going at it from the widest possible lens. Post-Fordism then in this analysis is a period since 1973 that relied increasingly on niche production and marketing of ever more disposable items. These people are, I think, producing uh, coffee makers here in China. A retreat from state regulation and safety nets that had stabilized the boom and bust business cycles. Highly polarized labor markets, uh, I'm sure we represent them here in this room. Uh, insecure work arrangements, again, an explosive acceleration of circulating credit and investment capital that I know we'll hear about here, and a social and cultural emphasis on difference. When you're thinking about processes, I want to argue, that are so far-reaching and yet so difficult to pin down in a strict chronicle of discrete events, thinking with that single dominant corporation can give us permission to address, through individual people and places, these long-range processes like the mass entry of married women into the paid labor force in the 20th century US, the federal redistribution of capital out of the older industrial regions of the United States into the formerly populist South and West, migrations within and across national boundaries, and the revolution against white supremacy that we know domestically as the civil rights movement and internationally as the end of the European colonial system after World War II. Another way to use a corporation, though, is to take it as a vertical sample that runs through the layers of finance, management, labor, perhaps advertising, political activity through lobbying and donations, uh, cultural production, and so on. So it can give us uh, a slice that is manageable. Again, the point is not that somehow corporations as objects of study can cover everything, but rather that they can throw an analytical and narrative fence around many overlapping long-range processes and thereby help us think concretely, as concretely about them as we do about Watergate or the Vietnam War. Now, if that doesn't work for you, another argument for what the Social Science Research Council uh, called at one point the corporation as a social institution, and an argument that was very salient in that historical window between the fall of the Soviet Union and 9-11, uh, is that they are the once and future rivals of the nation state. Uh, that more typical unit of analysis for modern histories. So if visual art is one way to apprehend history through corporate actors, then for those who prefer numbers, uh, I'm going to offer this from an analysis by Peter Chola at the London School of Economics. Probably this is really familiar to you in one form or another, a list of the largest economies in the world. Now, that's a very crude metric, and what Chola has done here is actually compare not the size of economies like the entire US economy to the entire General Motors economy, but rather um, the annual revenues of uh, a General Motors to the annual, uh, essentially, revenues, tax receipts of a given government. Because his argument is that these are the two entities that are kind of duking it out in the international arena for influence and ability to, um, to deploy power. And so if you do what he um, did, again, for the turn of the 21st century, you see that the initial list here is standard um, 
usual suspects, right? The World War II combatants minus the collapsing Soviet Union, and uh, Brazil, one of the ex-colonial states that's rising rapidly at that time. But then you move to the next list, and here we go again. Um, the ones that would have appeared on the cruder metric are represented here in this more fine grain analysis that LSE is offering us. Um, what's really striking, though, I've just given you the top 15, is that of the top 100, um, in this more precise measure, fewer than a third of the largest uh, economies measured by these revenues, uh, fewer than a third of the top 100 are, in fact, nation states. So more than two thirds are uh, corporations. And out of the top 200, it still only budges uh, barely to uh, 33 nation states versus all the rest are corporations. So if you need to make an argument to a uh, committee that you are want to study a corporation as an actor in the 20th century, this is a good place um, to, to start. It also raises intriguing questions about the long-term relationship among the various spheres of social power. Uh, and it gives us purchase on the transnational stage that has become so crucial to understanding later 20th century history. If we start with a kind of Hegelian schema in which there are domains of state, family, and civil society, and as has been pointed out here very trenchantly, this final category includes all voluntary associations, it includes churches, little leagues, uh, the Congress on Racial Equality, as well as General Motors and Walmart. Um, then over the long modern history of the corporation, we can watch sovereignty shifting among these spheres. And we can follow the intellectual traditions that question the firmness of the boundaries between them. If, for example, the British South Africa Company is essentially a subcontractor for the colonization of Zambia, or if Enron wins energy concessions and neoliberalizing India because of its political linkages to the Bush administration, then where exactly is the dividing line between the private company and the democratic state? Does governance happen through governments, or as an Enron VP testified to the US House, is a private company actually more effective at executing US foreign policy goals? Quote, the electricity projects in India are serving as action-forcing events Enron tells the US House of Representatives, uh, that are getting the host countries, places like India, to finally implement the legal and policy changes long urged upon them. So if you, if you follow this um, particular line in which uh, corporations are gaining power in a neoliberalizing political sphere, then uh, this is not a startling statement, and nor is it historically novel. It simply uh, gives us a node from which to examine this in the 500 year history of um, outsourcing state functions to private actors. If corporate hospitals business model, to take another side of this, requires the intensification of unwaged family care for the sick at home, something that probably many people have also experienced here, then in what sense is the family outside of the corporation? If Nike can call into creation an export processing zone that effectively lies outside the political control of the sovereign nation where it is technically located, then how are we to weigh the content of expanding democracy in the 20th century? Does the uh, form of democracy and of democratic citizenship expand in the post-colonial and post-Soviet moments only to see that over which citizenship has power shrinking uh, because the state is ceding more of its uh, zone of sovereignty to these private actors. And again, this can happen at the level of the household and at the level of um, international relations. As James Ferguson, James Ferguson argues, geographer James Ferguson argues, is Chevron actually even in Angola when it is primarily an offshore facility employing international migrants? It changes the entire topography, the entire geography of nation state interactions uh, when we take up the corporation as the organizing agent. Is a failed state then, or an authoritarian government, perhaps more hospitable to some corporate goals than is a stable democracy? And if again, uh, what we see here is not a, uh, an even distribution of resources in that contest, what, is the, uh, what are the implications for the future of democracy if in fact democratic states may not be the best home for corporate activity? Finally, I just want to continue the legal discussion um, that has been raised so um, thoroughly by our speakers by mentioning a couple of US Supreme Court cases which are testing the relationship between the state and the corporation 
in ways that are very specific to the late 20th century. Again, as you've heard uh, in the legal history of the corporation, you see a constant tension uh, and uneasiness over whether a corporation represents, in fact, a group of uh, citizens engaging in voluntary activity who cannot be constrained, therefore, because it would be a loss of, of citizenship rights, or does it represent uh, a creature entirely created by at the at the pleasure of the sovereign whose um, existence can be removed at any moment if it fails to serve the, the common good? Or finally, does it represent um, a real entity, a person in its own right, in the same way that we can talk about a nation state as representing a real entity somehow above and beyond our collective um, individualities, right? So these are three theories of what the corporation is that we see in political history. And in two cases right now, these have been tested in interesting ways. You probably caught uh, Dukes versus Walmart stores, uh, which has been analyzed beautifully by uh, Liza Featherstone at The Nation magazine and in her book. Uh, this was the case in which uh, had the certification of a class of plaintiffs, namely 1.5, uh, 1.6 million women who had worked at Walmart um, and had, according to their complaints, suffered the lack of promotion and underpayment relative to their male peers um, over a 10-year period, 20-year period. Uh, had that received certification from the Supreme Court in the final adjudication of Dukes v. Walmart, it would have been the largest class action lawsuit in history. And it would have perhaps addressed what's clearly a problem for us today, how to um, deal with the scale of multinational corporate actors. If the category of worker must go up against the category of the corporation, how do you equalize that power uh, differential? Are these individual contracts or are these in fact uh, two groups pairing off. And finally, um, just so you can see, this is Betty Dukes here, the plaintiff in that case. Again, that was a failed certification. Uh, the one on the bottom, Kiobel versus uh, Royal Dutch Shell, is a case that we're expecting a decision on um, this year in which uh, we're addressing this question of corporate personhood again. Can uh, people, such as the plaintiff's picture here, Esther Kiobel is in the middle, who experienced uh, torture and execution of many of their relatives in Nigeria as part of uh, corporate operations by Royal Dutch Shell in cahoots with um, authoritarian governments, can they bring a claim against Royal Dutch Shell, a corporate person, in court in the same way they could against a single agent acting as a torturer or executioner for an authoritarian state um, if that were an individual person. So uh, I'm sure in our conversation we can address some of the, the questions that these cases raise. We'll just notice um, that uh, debates on corporate personhood have been raised at a moment where personhood in general has suffered um, many uh, inroads from different directions between cyborgs and uh, biotechnology on the one hand and of course the, the ongoing debate over fetal personhood. Um, I think it's worth admitting that uh, if corporations can sharpen our analysis of something as fundamental as personhood, uh, sovereignty, or the relationship between democracy and capitalism, there is plenty of work left to be done in uh, a long tradition that we invite as many injuries as possible to. Thank you. Forgive me for that. and values in our social economy 
where accumulation is mainly through financial channels and transactions, such as mergers and acquisitions, uh, stock buybacks, as opposed to industrial production, production of goods and services, investments in fixed investments, plants, equipment, R&D. The social economy of financialization then privileges the buying and selling of corporations. Um, in a sense, the use of profits not necessarily to reinvest, right, but to engage in share boosting activities. Corporations are thus shorn of their multiple stakeholders, uprooted from their local ties and constituents, and placed into a commoditized space of exchange where only stock price appreciations or proclamations thereof matter. According to Wall Street's worldview, corporations are equivalent to their stock price. They're not long-term social institutions, but disposable items in investment portfolios. In other words, in this contemporary construction, the buying of a corporation's stock has ceased to be simply an ownership of that stock, but rather the ownership of the corporation itself. Corporation has become their stock, or, uh, corporations who have become their stock are no longer self-governing long-term social institutions. This radical transformation, whereby corporations come to be fully equated with their stock price and beholden to financial market demands, depended upon the mining of institutional infrastructure to redistribute to institutional shareholders and financial advisors. Short-term shareholder value literally ate the bureaucratic organization. So first it's important to take this idea that, that corporations are their stock and thus a collection of individual shareholders seriously as a kind of historical cultural model or origin myth that has been enacted in practice, a virtualism. One could certainly argue that Citizens United as a reflection and enactment of the shareholder value ideology, where the individual shareholder stands in for and symbolizes the corporation. Many scholars such as Lynn Stout have argued that the very idea that the corporation's purpose is to maximize shareholder value is not only a myth, but a blatant misreading of corporate law. Historically, fearing the subsuming of entrepreneurial proprietorships into complex uh, into complex corporate forms, many neoclassical advocates sought to reduce the multidimensional corporation into the one-dimensional framework of the individual owner, entrepreneur, shareholder. This imposition of particular neoclassical paradigms onto a complex social organization has had the long-standing reverberating effect of providing a justification for the denial of modern corporations' multiple constituents. Of course, the ahistorical imposition was only possible also with the help of a powerful narrative that retold corporate and uh, stock market history with the fable of, stock, of shareholders at the center um, as owners and originators of corporate America. Now, whereas historically the stock market has enabled owners of private enterprises to cash out, right? these shareholders exchange shares or cash for shares of stock, not control or totalizing ownership of the enterprise. According to neoclassical revisionism, this transaction then legitimated the shareholder as a new owner, controller, recipient of all corporate largesse. With this symbolic as well as monetary transfer, the shareholder now symbolized and stood in for the whole of the corporation. It became the sole locus of concern and analysis. The reimagining of the shareholder as embodiment of the corporation enabled neoclassical advocates to rationalize that the corporate interest was identical with the self-interest of the shareholder. The problem, however, is that neoclassicism equates shareholder ownership with ownership by private business families and entrepreneurs, when in fact, most modern shareholders never, have never run corporations. Although there are certainly instances where shareholders as close family or friends were operationally a part of the business, for the most part, Shareholders in general have been historically removed from corporations as providers of capital to owners, not necessarily to the enterprise itself, not managers of corporations. What is forgotten is that historically shareholders have had a distant relationship to the public corporation as they have looked toward the stock market to realize their gains. What neoclassical advocates and Wall Street advocates ignore and obscure is that the politics of shareholder value, which insists that corporations should be run only for shareholders has the effect of concentrating control over corporations in those institutions that speak for and in the name of the shareholders, Wall Street and the stock market. 
this discursive and practical reorganization laid the foundations for a form of social violence tantamount to the institutional erasure of the groups of the interests of all groups concerned besides shareholders, or rather, their proxies. Now let me turn a little bit to Wall Street. Um, Wall Street culture, I mean. The globalizing yet local and institutional culture of Wall Street financial institutions um, has been a dominant cultural model in this picture. Right throughout the financial world has been the understanding that bureaucratic corporations with their multiple stakeholders and commitments, long-term workforce, not to mention their breadth and depth of infrastructure, were not only underperforming according to financial values of short-term shareholder value, though by many other measures many corporations are performing quite steadily, but also that these institutions and their employees were somehow unmeritocratic and deserving of massive downsizing. Utilizing the wedge of meritocracy to wrest corporate control away from the corporations themselves and to legitimate financial worldviews and practices was made possible through the long-standing construction of Wall Street as the pinnacle of meritocratic economic practice, buttressed by a culture of smartness. Specifically, over the past 30 years, I argue, Wall Street has built and framed itself as the smartest in the world, the masters of the universe, through the strategy of recruiting its prestigious front office employees only from the nation's most elite universities, such as Princeton and Harvard, in order to create a halo effect and capitalize on the status already cultivated by these bastions of elitism. Correspondingly, financial actors have actively positioned their own institutional culture as one characterized by speed, real-time market simultaneity, innovation, and brilliance by touting their specific culture of smartness and explicitly framing the broader institutional culture of corporate America as slow, stagnant, and excessively bureaucratic. Perhaps most damagingly, employees and the institutions of corporate America were conflated with each other and constructed on the one hand as slow, run-of-the-mill, mediocre, nine-to-five, and more explicitly on the other hand as fat, dumb, and stupid, end quote. This strategy of heralding financial actors and institutions at the expense of, and in order to, discredit corporate America helped to solidify the increasingly taken for granted assumption of public corporations' ineptitude, as well as instantiate the winner versus loser, prop loser proposition where Wall Street was entrusted and justified to restructure corporate America according to its particular models and measures. After 30 years of such restructuring, it is not surprising that critical management scholar Gerald Davis has observed, quote, the twilight of the U.S. corporation. Lest such a proclamation sound too alarmist, Davis highlights the detritus of the corporate landscape through the compelling evidence that today, investment firms and short-term investment vehicles with trillions of dollars of corporate assets under management actually own the largest share of corporate America. BlackRock, an investment firm, is the single largest shareholder of one in 10 American corporations. What is at stake in, and what are the massive implications of, having financial and investment management firms from mutual to private equity funds own corporate America? Of course, while the differences matter, whether a corporation is owned by a relatively passive firm or actively managed private equity fund, the point is that being controlled by relatively short-term investors with an expedited time frame is the new norm. Let us take the example of corporate ownership in the hands of a private equity firm. In a nutshell, private equity firms are comprised of investment funds that acquire corporations, which these firms are supposed to actively manage by installing their own management teams. These funds are characterized by explicit expiration dates i.e. a limited time frame, usually five years or so, before the companies that make up the fund portfolio must be resold again before the companies, uh, because the investors that have provided the capital for the funds in the first place expect their return. In these contexts, corporations are bought and sold and passed around every five years or so. Now, even if all private equity firms and funds are not homogenous, the point I want to underscore here is that private equity in general privileges a short-term temporality and an orientation to corporate institutions characterized by continually repackaging them for sale. There's perhaps no better sign of the end of the public corporation as we knew it than the singular example of being transformed into a short-term investment in a portfolio that is exchanged every five years. <laughs> 
If the corporation today is little more than a nexus of contracts, a collection of brands and other intellectual properties, or an asset in financial portfolios, to what extent is it still an organization? The shift from managerial to shareholder power in large companies created a new source of lateral power at the top, populated by Wall Street institutions, advisors, and institutional shareholders, as well as corporate executives oriented towards financial growth. Corporate America, as Richard Center claims, is transformed into structures most attractive to empowered investors, designed to, quote, look beautiful to a passing voyeur. Now, while the collapse of bureaucracy, excuse me, has been long been theorized, it isn't clear to me whether we have fully accounted for the social loss that cohered to them, especially since organizational life, to the extent that they mediate with financial values and practices, are even more ephemeral than ever. From the standpoint of the contemporary moment, when socioeconomic inequality in the United States has surpassed even that of the Great Depression, what is at stake in recuperating bureaucratic managerial capitalism? A Janus faced context characterized by stable organizations and institutions, but also suffocating routinization. In other words, have scholars, in their rightful critique of these hierarchies, exploitations, and repetitive cadences, not fully accounted for the socioeconomic benefits of these organizations? Has fear of being perceived as nostalgic or sanctioning the downsides and segregations of Fordism and Taylorism prevented us from fully assessing the costs of our current era of financialization? My point is not so much to advocate a return of the bureaucratic machine, but rather to recognize the loss and disappearance of an unexpected locus for challenging workplace inequality, which I'm not going to have time to get into, but I'm happy to in the Q&A. An instructive example is from uh, sociologist Richard Sennett, a 60s activist who raged against the bureaucratic machine. And yet, the very experience of the dislocations wrought by the new culture of capitalism allowed him to interpret, reinterpret, the possibilities of the old corporation. In fact, he reframes normative critiques of Weber's iron cage to argue that not only was a lived experience of agency possible under that cage, but that the cage provided to some extent stability, steadiness of purpose, and the gift of organized time. The form of rigidity became the primary locus of discontent to articulate and contain all that was wrong with bureaucracy. In a sense, then, the diverse actual context and negotiations of social and economic practices mattered less. Bureaucracy itself had literally become the enemy, and its elimination was thus presumed to be liberating. Ironically, what many social analysts have realized in hindsight is that in this dismantling, quote, the social has been diminished while capitalism remains. In other words, embedded within bureaucracy were social relationships and employment promises, along with a temporal anchor that allowed the development and actualization of these social and work relations. Moreover, for much of the 20th century, especially in the wake of the civil rights and other social movements, corporate institutions and employers were a main focus of social reform and amelioration. Policies, programs, regulations, from environmental protection to equal employment initiatives were scaffolded upon bureaucratic organizations as appropriate locales, not only to build a stable society, but also to create sociality and spur their struggles for inclusivity. Since corporations play a vital role in shaping and organizing middle class daily life, a constellation of organizations and programs built up around them through decades of engagement. But now, that corporations are no longer robust long-term institutions resembling stocks and portfolio, more than long-standing bulwarks of economic productivity, our society of organizations has increasingly transformed itself into a short-term portfolio society. So I just end with three quick questions, which is, with the demise of, or the collapse of bureaucracy, what are the attending consequences? Well, we now have the CEO, a short-term investor, that thinks about exit strategy from the moment of entrance. We have the management consultant, as ideal typical manager, characterized by distance, that only knows the organization through restructuring. We have the demise of the corporate ladder, right? What Pamela Laird, business historian, has argued that the ladder helped create synthetic social capital for those who lacked it. And now, in a sense, we have um, organizations or lack thereof that privilege the thick networks of the elites, right, who don't need these institutions because their thick networks and resources serve as their safety net. In stark contrast, 
the child of the less privileged has a different relationship to institutional chaos or nothingness. For the marginalized, fixed the work bureaucracies served as a promissory note for social inclusion, the next steps on which decline, already fused onto the work process itself, were not arbitrary and presumably would not disappear once these previously excluded employees arrived. And so I ask us to ponder what happens when this legible social map has been dismantled. Thank you. Thank you. 
um, and developed a global network of branches, correspondents, and affiliates that was unprecedented in American banking history. And the end result of this corporate strategy exercise was hardly academic, for it laid the intellectual foundations for the creation of the financial services giant Citigroup in the $83 billion merger of insurance firm Traveler's Life and Citicorp in 1988. And at the time, Citicorp was so vast and diverse that pundits who lauded the, uh, the, the merger termed it as too big to fail. The organization of Citigroup City signaled the dissolution of the remnants of New Deal banking regulation through the passage of the Graham Leach Bailey Act, also known as the Financial Services Modernization Act, legalizing the merger after the merger had already been consummated. Citibank is an excellent history. It is, without a doubt, the best book written on cities city's 200-year history, partly because it's one of the few books written <laughs> on city's 200-year history, but it's also one of the best books written on American corporation, period. But it is corporate history written for the corporation. It is corporate autobiography. And like any autobiography, it is selective in its presentation of historical facts and its interpretation of historical events. So then, for those of us people who are not corporations, what should our corporate history look like? One could point to the recently uh, glamorized work falling under the, the history of capitalism label as an example of what this other corporate history, this people's corporate history, could look like. But I'm also a little wary of how the subfield is forming. And don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are historians of capitalism. But I think there's, a, 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 of course, the question of the newness of the field. And more importantly for me, I worry that the recent interest in the history of capitalism resurrects the white male as subject and author of capitalism history, capitalism's history while pushing aside the work by and on women and people of color who have made capitalism their subject, even as they were the subjects of capitalism. Thus, all the incredible work that has been done across the history on the growth of prisons, for instance, does not fall under the rubric of the history of capitalism, nor does a book like Barbara Ramsby's biography of Ezra Robeson Goodison. To take another example, the authors of a recent essay on Bloomberg.com expressed excitement over discovering a relationship between capitalism and slavery without bothering to mention Eric Williams' book, Capitalism and Slavery, published in 1944, or Philip Foner's Business and Slavery, published in 1941, or C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins, published in 1938, or Du Bois' Black Reconstruction, published in 1935, or George Patmore's Life and Struggles of Negro Toilers, published in 1931, or the work of Herbert Aftiker, or any of the other work produced over the last century within a critical Marxist or Pan-African tradition that has started with the analytical premise that the history of capitalism is inseparable from the history of white supremacy, and that we need to begin with an understanding of what Cedric Robertson has called racial capitalism. Neither white supremacy nor racial capitalism were amongst the analytical concerns of Cleveland and Hurtis, but these concerns, along with the question of American imperialism, are an important component of the history of Citigroup, no matter how one attempts to prettify it through the rhetoric of managerialism and the institutional orthodoxies of managerial rationality. One only need look at the history of the annual Citibank minstrel show held in their headquarters at 55 Wall Street in the 1920s, wherein bank, wherein bank staff performed coon songs in blackface, or the spe spatial manifestation of the lineage of white supremacy in the bank's neoclassical architecture, or the references to the, the Panama branch of its subsidiary, the International Banking Corporation, as the, quote, nigger bank, unquote, or more profoundly, the ways in which white American racial thinking shaped global lending policies and bank, uh, uh, sorry, shaped global lending practices and bank policies in places like Cuba and Haiti. And this is something that Emily Rosenberg attends to in her work. But it is important to realize that not only does this kind of anecdotal historical accounting emerge out of a structural historical inflection, but there is a complementary set of narratives ignored by Cleveland and Curtis that tell a different story about Citibank, and that offers a radical counterpoint to Citibank's corporate autobiography. They are, of course, the historical stories told about Citigroup in Panama and Cuba and Haiti, where one bank vice president was by, look, excuse me, where one bank vice president was once described as a true enemy of the Haitian people, and all of those places, both in the U.S. and abroad, where capitalism's crisis has been more or less permanent, and that, though they may appear to be on the peripheries of the history of the American corporation, are central to American life. Thank you very much.